with that. For, for a lot of people who, who they, you know, the, the Bible says that there'll be many who say, I knew you, and then Jesus will go, no, you didn't know me. You knew, some, you knew religion. You knew a religious figure, but you didn't know me. You and I were never together. Um, so, there's no condemnation. Here we go. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. The Holy Spirit sets you and I free. The law does not set us free. All of you answered correctly before. You don't want to live under the law because it's, it's, a, it's bondage, it's a burden. But the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. The flesh is not condemned. The sin in the flesh is condemned. Verse 4 through 6. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, Jesus did all those things that we've already talked about, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I don't walk towards the flesh, I walk according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those of us who are walking according to the Spirit, we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is is life and peace. Here's another thing the Spirit does. The Spirit sets our course by setting our thoughts on a life that is full of life and peace. How many of y'all like peace? How many, when the kids finally go to bed, you're going, ah, do you hear that? No, what do you hear? That's it. You don't hear anything. That's what we like. It's just, they're quiet. There's peace and quiet. We like peace. Some people don't like peace. Um, I had a conversation with somebody the other day about, I, I, think, I think they need, uh, this person's thought process was that there are some people who need there to be so much chaos in the world that they don't have to listen to the chaos in their own head. And there's probably a lot to be said about that. Verse 7 through 8 says, Because the mind set on flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Christian, you are not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you have the Holy Spirit, you are connected to God and his perfect law in relational living. So you see, God's law isn't bad, but through the Spirit, when we have Spirit living and we live by the Spirit, we just naturally are drawn to the law of God. We, we're naturally drawn to do the right things, to think the right thoughts, to, to have that life and to have that peace. Verse 10 says, uh, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, think about that, the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. What kind of what kind of energy do you have inside of you if you have the Holy Spirit? Well, just the ability to raise the dead. Just, just the Spirit of God who had the ability to raise Jesus from the dead. That's, you know, that's, it's, you know, just a mild nuclear reactor that you have inside you. No, no big deal. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So the Spirit is our source of life from within not just external, but internal. I said it earlier. How, how okay, I, I've, got to, I've got to go back home. I've got to plug back in. I am constantly looking for phone chargers in my house. I don't know how it happens. I'm sure that one day, since Em and Julie are not here, and there's no way they'll watch this video, I can say this. I'm sure that I will go up some, one day, and I will find in Julia's room 
six phone chargers plugged into the same outlet. Somehow she'll figure out how to do that. Because I can never, Sally and I, like, we share one. We've got 20 in the house, and she and I are, sh- like, sharing one. I don't have to go look for God to plug into him to be recharged. He's inside me. I'm having a struggle. I'm having a bad day. I'm in the midst of a conflict. I need, God, I need some help. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. I don't have to go anywhere because of what is inside me, the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. I've got that spirit inside me. So the only, the only thing I need to do is stop and go, help. Stop. Refresh me. Stop. Help me right now. Help me take this thought captive because otherwise it's going to take me captive. Help, help me to have the compassion right now that Jesus has for this person. I want to have that same compassion. Okay. Verse uh, 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Verse 13 and 14. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if you're living by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The Spirit obligates us to live up to the calling of Christ, but he also gives us the power to do that. He obligates us, and then he meets that obligation. He fulfills that, that, that necessary power to do this. So he, he, he obligates us, then he fills that obligation, and he calls us um, as with Christ. We are children of God, and we also get the inheritance that goes along with being children of God. How many of y'all are in line to be an inheritant, uh, um, uh, an heir, thank you, an heir of, of a millionaire? Because if so, we need to do lunch. Okay, yeah, we're going to do lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my dad's philosophy is when he dies, he's leaving me everything, including his debt. And that's, I, don't, I don't want that. We are heirs with Jesus Christ. Our dad, God, he doesn't own the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills, and then he owns all the stars and all the planets and all the universe. He, he owns everything. His inheritance will probably be quite hefty, even divided by several million of us. It's still going to probably be enough for all eternity. Verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Daddy, Dada, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit testifies not only to God, but to me, reminding me of who I am. He's reminding God who I am. At the same time, he's reminding me who I am. You're a child of God. Mike, you're a child of God. Man, I just, I, gosh, I just had this horrible thought. What, where that? Mike, you're a child of God. That was an arrow from the enemy. You're wearing the, blessed, the, the, the shield of faith. You have the shield of faith up. It extinguishes the fiery dart from the enemy. Just take it for what it was. Take, take that thought captive and remember you're a child of the Most High God. Okay, well, how does a child of the Most High God act? Well, I don't have to be afraid because I'm a child of the Most High God. Verse 17 through 22 says this, If children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is uh, to be revealed to us. If you've got, uh, if you're reading the King James, it says, I reckon. And uh, I I love what... um, Joe Fouch said, he said, apparently the guy's from the South. Paul's from the South. But it's actually reckon is a mathematical term. I've, I've, I've done the math. I've compared Christ's sufferings and his righteousness, and I've decided that his righteousness is far better. It, it, it's like if you have to choose, go with, the, go with the column that has Jesus in it. Even if it costs you, it will never cost you all that you will gain. 
The anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What is that talking about? Basically, I think what it's, what it's saying is that when Adam and Eve sinned, they weren't the only ones who suffered. The whole earth suffered. The whole earth began to deteriorate. The whole earth began to have conflict and turmoil and, and all that we see going on in Hawaii right now and all that we see going on in different, different places. Uh, the, the earth is groaning. The earth is excited because it knows eventually daddy's coming back and he's going to fix everything. We're going, to get, we're going to get a restart. He's going to make us even better than we were before. So if you, are, if you know somebody who is a is super duper uber um, environmentalist and, and ecologist and they're like, well, you Christians need to be more, more excited and more careful about what you do. I absolutely agree that as Christians, we should be great stewards of what we've been given. But having read Revelation, I realize that no matter how hard I work to save the spotted owl, Eventually, they're going to burn up with everything else. But as soon as all are gathered that are supposed to be gathered, then he, it sets in motion him coming back and making the earth even better than it was before. So if you've got somebody who really, you want to blow their mind and they go, hey, you should say to them, look, I know how you can make, you can bring back every extinct animal that's ever, be, ever been made extinct. Here's how you can bring them back. What? Get right with Jesus. Because you may be the one we're waiting on. And, and, once, and, once, and once it's completed, he comes back and he puts it. Look, you guys, we didn't get to see the first creation. We get to see the second creation. And I'm looking forward to seeing what dinosaurs really look like. Things will be cool. Um, and, and, uh, but that's just me. Verse 23 says this. Not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The Spirit living inside us is, is and I don't mean this to be uh, minimizing, but the Spirit living inside us is like the down payment for the time that we actually get to walk in the glory of God all the time in the presence of God. We have a down payment. Now, it's a substantial down payment. We have the spirit of the living God, the nuclear reactor living inside us. That's pretty impressive, but even that is a first fruit. It's like a down payment. It's like, okay, well, here's your sample. And they're like, man, that's the most awesome thing ever. Okay, that's just a sample of what is coming. What is coming is even better. First fruit. He's given me a taste of what is yet to come. Verse 24 says, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what they've already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we pers uh, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Verse 26 and 27 says, in the same way, in the same way as this hope for what we haven't seen, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit helps in our weakness. And he develops in us strengths. That's how we develop strengths, is that we find our weakness and we begin to develop it. Well, why is it that God always like, makes me wait on somebody? Don't, guys, don't think about your wives. Just, just go with me on this. Why is, it that I'm always, why is it that I'm always struggling with patience? Because it's a weakness. And God wants to strengthen your weakness. And that's a weakness in you. So guess what? He's going to do what it takes to strengthen that weakness. Well, why didn't he, but, but I'm really good at persevering under pressure. Ooh, okay, if you're strong in that, he, he's not going to work on that. He's going to work on the things that you're weak in. Why? Because he wants you to be everything that you can be. 
Why? Because he loves you. Why? I don't know why. But I know that he prunes us, he puts us back on the vine, and he prunes 